Hi. <laughs> um, so just Hi. go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell me the title of your piece. Great. My name is Yu Hao Zhao. I am an artist working a lot with digital tools and new media. Um, and my piece is called Unreachable Destination. Um, so I typically ask people when they made this piece, but this piece was in fact a commission for this New Art City Festival 2023. And this is the first time that I'm seeing it completed. Um, so tell me more about your workflow to creating it and kind of what led you to, to virtual space. Yeah, well, I think this piece is actually very um, interesting and important to me, um, to my also workflow as an artist, both working with analog media and digital media, but my background, I'm more uh, started. I went to school for new media art and 3D animation. So I'm very used to uh, started thinking about and sketching out my art using very quick tools on a computer. So I would, you know, very easily take images online, kind of collage them or edit them in Photoshop and using them as, you know, reference images. Um, but for the past couple of years, I've started trying and experimenting more to incorporate analog or even, I would say, very low tech um, method into my creative process and also starting uh, thinking about a project using these ideas or method of making things. So actually this project or this um, or the visuals were coming from a series of um, nine drawings I did through, uh, I think from 2020 to earlier this year. Um, so it's wax pastel drawings on top of um, black paper. And so these drawings, and then later on, you know, we met and then we talked about, I showed you all these drawings and um, I already started kind of digitizing or kind of using these drawings as inspirations to make 3D models for the 3D world. Um, and that was really exciting for me because you really have full control of controlling the scale, especially of these things and really thinking big. Um, because on the, my, my drawing, they are 11 by 14 inches. But when I was making them, I was really thinking about them in very large scale as big rocks or trees, um, mountains and the landscape. So I think, uh, New York City is a great platform for me to really quickly um, kind of started to think about these ideas and um, also being able to kind of show them on the browser is a very kind of liberating way for, for me. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just remembering seeing the drawings in your studio. And I remember you also had a projector up of uh, it was, I think, a, it was a 3D render of one of the sculptures that maybe it was a prototype of one of the sculptures we were going to see. But I remember there being some other part of the projection that I'm forgetting, like maybe you were projecting onto paper or something. Can you remind me? Yes, so it was an installation um, and the projector was projecting one of the virtual sculptures rotating onto the wall with a no background or just a black background. Um, and there are three, I think, acrylic paintings hanging on the wall and one uh, paper drawing, the one of the original wax pastel drawings hanging on the wall. So using um, kind of projection mapping techniques, some of these paintings are also being lit up and deemed off. Um, so on and off, kind of like turning lights on and off on them. So for that, I guess, specific installation, I was trying to experiment with um, kind of using installation, right, to merge kind of the virtual and the real world. Um, and also because it's an animation, right? It's also telling kind of like a narrative 
um, or kind of choreographed that things are happening throughout a period of time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, which is something I think I've always been doing for my previous projects, right? Which is um, kind of thinking about the relationship of um, making things in the real world and in the virtual world and how they, what's like the boundary between them, right? Is there a boundary? Um, where is the boundary and how to kind of move between these two zones? Like what even constitutes like reality or realism, the kind of like impression that you can impart. Um, and so you were doing your MFA during the pandemic, right? I'm kind of curious, like what your practice was like before and like how the pandemic affected it. Mm. Well, I actually, I finished my MFA in 2017. Oh, um, I don't know why I thought differently. <laughs> but I was teaching, you know, during the, the before, during and after the pandemic. Um, but it is true, I, I think the pandemic affect probably a lot of artists in terms of how they um, like make art and how they think about their subject matter. Um, and that's true for me, you know, it was actually very, um, very inspiring experience because um, I've been living in LA since 2015. And then um, in 2020, uh, because I was teaching and then we switched to teaching online remotely. Um, I believe in spring 2020, so I taught one class and then uh, I taught one class at home remotely. And then in summer and after we got the news that we're gonna keep continuing remote teaching, right? So I started to think, oh my God, I'm gonna stay, be in the same apartment, um, teaching the same class again. And I wasn't really looking forward to it. So that led to me um, moving to Joshua Tree, which is, three hours away from LA. And it's, um, I lived in 29 Palms, which is the town just outside of Joshua Tree National Park. Um, so I had a lot of time being able to go to the park and explore. And I also started rock climbing. And that was my first time uh, really lived not in a city because I grew up in a city and I moved around, but I always been living in cities. And I, before I, I did that, I wasn't so sure whether I would love, you know, living in, in kind of like places with less people. I was kind of afraid of it. Um, but then when I, when that actually happened, it was really a great experience. You know, um, I feel so inspired by the um, sunset of the desert. I think a lot of people love the desert because of that and the the such like an open view right you can really see um things very far away and that really changed the um kind of how i see the world in a way um and in some sense i think that's why i also really like 3d tools right because um you feel like you're so empowered you're like really you can create a world in whichever way you can and it can be really small or really big um, so that's the the point i kind of really started thinking about how to kind of create natural landscape and how to kind of um, transform my experience right in real nature to the digital world and kind of share that experience to my audience and did this sort of push you into more experimentation with like analog media? Like I remember you doing those those like colored pencil rubbings of the the rocks in Joshua Tree. Exactly. So um, I did this project or series. It's called a uh, rock scribble, which is also embracing uh, these um, online social media kind of short video format, you know, like the videos on TikTok. Um, so I would go to the park mostly and go explore different 
locations. Mostly in Joshua Tree National Park and then pick a location on the rock and take a piece of paper and wax pastel or crayon, uh, kind of just scribbles um, on rock. And it's a very improvised process. You know, for instance, if I look at the south side, I try to use, um, I'll be like, oh, I want to use orange. If the light is getting dark, I'll be like, oh, I want to add a more uh, black. And also experimenting with using this very simple process, but experimenting with different ways how to produce different visual looks. Um, so, and then afterwards, editing the video of me kind of drawing them and kind of post them onto TikTok, uh, kind of embracing also there's this trend of people going into like a national parks and show them, you know, oh, this is like a Joshua tree, you know, let me show you. Uh, if this is a the you know how Joshua Tree looks, um, so I think I had a lot of fun. But um, afterwards, I was thinking about how to like kind of you know take that into the digital world. So I started also playing with it using the, these images as textures for three um, D animations, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's kind of nice that you had this like respite from the computer and it, you were sort of then like finding your way back to like, what, what can I, how can I use a computer to, to think about these like feelings and experiences? Um, and I mean, I like what you were saying about scale and I like the, the landscape that is your, your background. There's this like canyon and you can see like a fist rising all the way up through the canyon. And there's like a tiny little person that is like determining the scale of it. And that's like emanating this gold, I know. <laughs> but I recognize this as the concept art for the, for the um, sculptures we're about to look at. Do you want to tell me more about the inspiration for that? Yes. Um... So, you know, after we talked and we talked about um, also knowing a, a bit more about the, the New Art City as a platform and tool, you know, I started to think about what kind of things I can make with it. And I think as we talked a little bit about just now, one of the very important thing to me as an artist is always about scale. Um, and when I made these drawings, you know, I've always been thinking a lot. I already was thinking about them in 3D world, right? So they're like rocks, landscapes. Um, but it was very hard to convey that to people, right? Because they just see them as they are on pieces of paper. So I had to create like a landscape, right? To, to kind of go with them. Um, but the other thing that's very interesting using 3D from a past experience, because it's a it's really like a 2D, right? Representation of a 3D world on your screen. Um, and sometimes it's kind of tricky to convey the sense of scale, right? Because there's perspective and all those things. For instance, if you put something really large, but they're very far away from the camera, you know, it's very hard to tell what how big it is. Um, so those are things I've been really experimenting with when I kind of putting up my um, world together on in New Art City because it's also interactive. Um, so for these concept art, back to the concept art, right? Um, I put a little person, right, or a figure. Sometimes it's a it's a little animal um, inside each thing, so that it shows um, the scale of the thing. I think that's also a very common method we see um, people do concept art for movies, um, and also I was also thinking a lot about the Chinese landscape painting uh, as a Chinese artist. And one very important thing composition wise for Chinese landscape painting is you're never really 
inside of it, right? The perspective, you're never feeling like you're part of the landscape. You're always very removed and very far away from it, um, almost like a God's perspective. Um, and you always see figures, they're tiny um, as part of the whole world or the nature. So sometimes there's a little figure on a boat or like a little figure climbing the mountain or like sitting, resting in a little pagoda. Um, so I think for some of these early concept art, I was also thinking a lot about that. Thank you. Um, and I guess my, my last question for this interview portion has to do with like archives and retrospection. Like how do you how do you handle like work that you've made in the past? How do you like store it? And like, how do you, what's your process for returning to it and like reformatting it? Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. Have you been asking kind of similar questions to um, other digital artists? Like, is it a kind of more of a digital artist question? I think it's really just a general artist question because I've been trying to find yeah. questions that will that will evoke like answers that are really representative of the person. And I really like this question yeah. because every answer is totally different. Some people really hate to return to things and it's really central to other people's projects. Yeah, um, it's, it's a great question because um, I think for me, it's been changing, um, you know, because I feel like when I work on these kind of digital productions, right? It's like, since because it takes longer, sometimes a couple months, sometimes it's like one year or a couple of years. Um, when I feel done with it, I really want to move on, right? To a subject, a new subject matter because the world has been changing so much so quickly these days, especially. Um, and, uh, but more recently, since I've been doing more drawings and kind of traditional media, uh, I've been also realizing the importance of making things, artwork in a series, right? Because usually you make the first work that's very, um, you know, it's like you got inspired by something, you know, you're very passionate, want to make something, right? And sometimes it's kind of, in a way, freer or easier because it's more experimental just want to get something out there but then the the second one piece of the same idea or the same series is very hard right because then you started to like overthink um and usually that one takes forever but then um i think the third one is hard too because you have the first and the second because so it's like a comparison and the third one would really kind of break the you know side by side comparison but i think after the three it's a lot easier right because you're really kind of building in um into that part of the visual language and i really like that and i think it's really um helpful for my creative process that i did mine drawings at the beginning, although they're very small, but I think I was really able to use them as, you know, reference to help me continue to execute the project. Um, but back to the archiving question, you know, I think almost all of my previous works, there is this um, digital component to it. You know, usually it's like videos or 3D animations um, or 3D models. And then when I show them to people, uh, they're usually being shown as site specific installations. So there's also kind of like a sculpture part of it. But maybe because I've always been travel and moved to different cities. So I think I never really made any physical things that's huge in scale it's always very ephemeral right mm -hmm. so i use like a cloth or i use um kind of little strings um or found objects 
and I've made some uh, sculptures, but they're also uh, kind of, you know, I was able to put them in a few storage boxes. Um, and I like that because I think, because they're site specific, every time I go to like a new place, I was able to, you know, I'm able to kind of re invent like another iteration of them. And I think in general, that's great about creating things digitally is because once you made, you know, the assets or the 3D models, um, you can always kind of reuse them, right? Which again, that's also very, something very empowering for me because I think, um, I also think that way when I make paintings or drawings, you know, I don't really see them as like one single, like authentic or like original art, right? I see them as to the images, right? That can be reused or can be like very quickly stick on 3D models. Um, so I feel like that's a good thing and a bad thing for me when I try to paint. Um, <laughs> yeah, because sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it, I seeing seeing the drawings in in the first place as these kind of future representations of a of a three dimensional idea, or they're like embedding the potential of of something else in them. It's they're like they're just kind of these these points along a process. I thought that was really exciting. Um, so that's my last interview question. So I'm going to shift to uh, sharing my screen. Um, I'm excited we can go into the space. Okay. Um, will you start just by reading the, the description out loud for me um, into the record? Yes. Unreachable destination. In Unreachable Destination, installation and mixed media artist Yu Hao Zhang represents her first solo show for virtual space. Zhang has spent much of the past three years investigating the possibility of creating digital landscape paintings through analog means. In adapting her wax pastel works to a world building project, Zhang's work evokes a landscape where the figure ground relationship is redefined and the figure becomes part of the landscape. Optical illusion and space exist in all of these new drawings where a hand evokes a face or choya wood growing out from a human hand. Holding on or letting go, falling or hanging, it's all a matter of perspective. Mm, thank you. So we materialize inside of a concrete room with this um, slightly wavy, like matte forest green floor. As we look through one of the windows, we can see some fog and some water. It looks very much kind of like the architecture of something you would see in a national park, very austere. There, the windows are just like empty space, these two small squares. And then through the doorway, we can see the first of these drawings, which is, uh, and there, there are now, there are three other, there are one, two, three, four, five other ones on these walls. They all have a black background, um, and there are these different inversions of like hands and arms, and there are is like colored rope involved in each of them in these different climbing knots, and so it's definitely playing with human forms, but not sort of complete human bodies. Like the one I'm looking at right now is this U shape of two two hands gripping this rope. There's another hand coming out of the bottom of the U shape that's smaller. And then the rope that's being held between these two hands is forming like a silhouette of a human um, in kind of a disjointed way. And I really like the, the kind of flamed white blue texture of this arm. Um, and I won't go through and individually describe all of these because they will be described in the catalog, but they're each kind of following this theme of looking, uh, you know, I'm looking at one where somebody is being suspended or there's somebody being suspended from a hand. Um, and then another one where it's these, these really big hands and the, there's like an inclined, here I go describing it. Anyway, 
<laughs> what can you tell me about the the drawings now that we're in the space? I know we've been discussing them a little bit. Yeah, I think um, I think it's always very interesting to see, you know, kind of like a version of the physical world um, artwork being like turned into something in the virtual space, um, which I think some of the shows on New York City, people have done that. And again, you know, this idea of scale I'm talking about um, that I'm always really interested in exploring as a 3D artist. Because um, I mentioned these drawings, they are 11 by 14 inches on paper, right? So when I put them into a virtual world, first of all, I was able to change the scale of them. And again, um, I wanted to kind of put them in room scale space, right? So really to, when you launch onto into the world, you get a sense of the scale of the world, right? So this is kind of like a room sized space. Um, yeah, and I think as you were mentioning, kind of this is like a function maybe as a visitor center um, to kind of, maybe conceptually or give the visitors a little bit of like context of what the the, the whole world is going to be about. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess the scale of these is probably more like three feet by four feet or something like that based on where the body is. Um, and I'm curious like, because I, I know that there were originally nine drawings and you included five here. Are these roughly sequential? Like, I'm really curious, like, what the different, where, which one is first and which one is third, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was kind of arranging them similarly in the way um, how the the people gonna see them in the mm. world. Um, but as you're seeing them as drawings, the one on the right, that. The, the hands with one leg and the robe. That one was the first one I did um, in the nine series, which as okay. you can see, actually, I, I did a bit more, um, the, the kind of the strokes is a bit rougher, right? Which, which I like that because I think some of the later ones, I, I started to think, to overthink too much when I made the drawing. Um, but I really like this first one because it really conceptualized a lot of ideas I kept uh, exploring later. Yeah, I wouldn't have exactly noticed that before, but you're yeah, you're so right. Like the 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 butterfly knots are they're very like elegant, um, but the 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 lines are very thick. The the inner part of the wire the the rope is this green, and then it's outlined in this nice um, kind of darkish yellow, and then the strokes on the hand and the arm. The flame texture is a lot lower resolution. It's it's a lot like you can really sort of sense the brush strokes more. Um, and there, yeah, this must be the second one that it's it's dealing with like the the sort of body forms are still in the 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 white and blue, um, and there's a little bit more detail to the rope. Yeah, and uh, the other thing you know, I think when I made these composition wise, I also. Also, the reason I chose to draw them on black paper is a negative space mm -hmm. as well, you know, um, which I feel like that also has to do with I was already kind of thinking in 3D, you know, so when I drew them, there was kind of this sense of, um, uh, you know, foreground, some things that's closer to you and further to you. And there is also this sense of, um, physics maybe, like a gravity, wind, um, and also kind of surreal, right? Because if these are robes, then due to the, the, the earth gravity, right? They definitely would not be dangling or hanging like that. Uh, totally. And I like- Yeah, but there's also a sense of like, because like on these ropes, yeah. Mm. 
And I'm curious, sort of like, obviously these are, these are related to climbing, that they're, they're figures climbing, they're using the vernacular of like climbing knots. Um, I'm curious, sort of what, what about rock climbing inspired you? Or like, how is that coming through in the work? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question because in a way it's very subtle. Um, you see there are figures climbing um, and there are ropes, which rope is like a very big part of um, climbing because it keeps you safe. Um, and I think for me, I'm still very new, you know, to, to climbing. Um, and I'm still growing, you know, a lot of skills. But climbing is really interesting as a sport because I think it requires both um, strength, technique, and also like mental, right? Because I think certain sports, um, maybe things like if you play golf, it's very mental and technical, right? Maybe it's less emphasis on the body strength, you know, to be like strong. Um, and there are certain ones, you know, it's like two out of three. But I think climbing, you really have to utilize all three of them. Um, and the mental part, I think, is a very important part of it. Um, and I feel like when I'm climbing, I'm always kind of negotiating whether I want to take more risk, right? Or um, kind of how can I like keep my head straight when I'm feeling like I'm not going to fall, right? Um, and I think a lot of these drawings are kind of about that kind of um, psychological mind when I'm climbing. Um, and also this, this feeling of negotiating with nature or more specifically the rock. Um, because I think that's also why people love climbing because you're kind of establishing this very intimate relationship with the rock that you can't really have if you're just, you know, seeing it from very far away or like walking around it, right? Because you really have to utilize the little features on the rock, touch it, get really close to it. You know, like I can smell it, I can feel the temperature of the rock. Um, and also really kind of seeing, usually you only see your hands, you know, and I think feet too while you're climbing. So I, I put a lot of these kind of hands um, inside all these body parts inside these drawings, because I think that's a very important um, image that I see that kind of relate myself interacting with, with nature. Yeah, so it's like you're, you in contrast to the landscape painting that you're referring to, you're very much a part of the landscape and then like the parts of your body that you're most focusing on then kind of become dilated in the in these like impressionistic drawings of the, the feelings of the like solitude with the rock. I guess it's also kind of interesting that like you're you're being supported by your belayer, right? I don't know if that's the right term mm -hmm. um, that like yes. there there is there is somebody on the other side of the rope. But when you're on the rock, you're kind of there with your hands. Exactly. Yeah. So it's also about, you know, trusting somebody else, right? Giving like trusting somebody else that can protect you if if you fall. And in a way, you know, the all the ropes and all the systems you create while you're climbing is actually a very safe system, you know. So if you do all the techniques correct, um in a way it's very safe as well. But it's really about that mental part, right? Um, and it's also about physics as <laughs> well, which which I, I I like. Yeah, you really have to trust about yourself. You're climbing on the moon. <laughs> yeah, it will be. I'm sure it's a very different experience. <laughs> 
So should we go, should we go out across this little land bridge? Sure. So we see the water and this undulating landscape and we find out oh, we can fly. Um, and there's a little bit of like water puddles in the bridge that we're crossing. And now in the distance, I can see one of these hands slowly rotating. Um, and we're, we're on either side of us is this huge like matte canyon. Um, and so now we can fly up inside of the sculpture. And I really do, I see the, the resemblance very clearly, but this looks like the first sculpture with the U shape of the two fists with the kind of flamed texture. But in 3D, the base forms these different triangles. So now it's, it's three different hands in this undulating shape and it's called holding on. Um, do you want to do you want to read the text? Would it be easier for you to have like the catalog in front of you, or is there like a, a way that would be easy for you to read this? Yes, I have it opened. Oh, great. Holding on. Are you a lost soul? I try to speak, but no words come out. You, you must be a lost soul if you can't speak. Here, let me show you around. After a few minutes, a gigantic hand slowly revealed itself out of the foggy sky. The hand moved down as it was going to hit me, but when we walked closer, it disappeared into thin air. The hand will not hurt us. It knows you're friendly. A lover's tear melt and turn into it. Oh, that's so beautiful. And uh, listener, I'm, I'm hearing these for the first time. <laughs> Um, I think it really like adds something to it, the like poetic description of the of the piece. So we're moving on through this canyon. Sorry, is there anything else that you wanted to say about this one? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're moving on through this canyon and now we see another one of these shapes and this is one of the darker um, green and orange ones that we saw on the back wall and there's this big green hand and there's a, a a human figure that's kind of suspended from the the index finger hanging down by a rope and this is called falling or hanging and this one is not animated um do you want to read the poem for this one yes falling or hanging a little person appeared in my hand and suddenly started to run. I was terrified because it looked like the little person was going to jump off. I quickly tied the little person to my finger using a hair tie. A voice cut through silence. It looks like you just found a little piece of yourself. You better take good care of it. Oh, so it's, it's like in the first one, you are the little like you are kind of a person and then it's like in the in the second one like the character that you're embodying is the hand and not the person i like your interpretation of it <laughs> um yeah it's it's fun to be like associating with this in real time and the the fog is so dense it's really like dreamlike um i think you i think you're totally right that the the matte landscape instead of a textured landscape really really fits so now around this corner, we're going through another valley and there's another rotating blue shape. And it, I realize I have just gone backwards. <laughs> um, so now we're, we're approaching a coastline and we're back towards some water and we look up and just out of the fog, I can see this person dangling from above holding a rope and they're sort of coming out of this rock that is that is up like rock island that's up in the center of this this water area so it's like a green person who who's holding this this arc of of yellow rope and this one is called pulling and i'll read the description of it right now I felt like my arms were locked into the side of my body, tingling. My hands were bright with pain, raw and powerful. Up high above the stars, 
two hands were floating in a cloud of space dust. It was a mirror image of the hands that I saw on Earth. Mm. I, yeah, it's like I feel I feel the the kind of solitude with the mountain, or like sort of the the phenomena that we were we were talking about earlier on. It's really cool to see these manifest both visually and through the words. Yeah, I think this one, the description, I I like it because it's a bit more abstract, um, but I also like it because it's indicating, as my interpretation, it's indicating a little bit that we're we're not on Earth. Right, mm. or somewhere else, um, and also showing this uh, the mentioning of the mirror image. I I I was thinking of um, since this one's above the water, right? You're also kind of seeing the reflection of it in the water as well. As above, so below, and it's interesting also to see kind of the iterative iterative process of writing these poems as somewhat maybe similar to the the process of making the the drawings in the first place that the the rules of the world are kind of becoming evident through the the process of making the writing mm -hmm. exactly yeah um and also you know i think i was also thinking a lot about not a lot but i was also thinking about mythology a lot Mm. Um, associating with like rocks formations and uh, uh, mountains. I think in China, a lot of people, you know, if you go to like a tourist attraction, they always name the, the rocks kind of similar to a figure or like a animal. Um, and a lot of times they tell you a mythology that people have been saying about it. Um, so there was one that's kind of like a local lady, right? She turned it into a big rock. And I always think those things are so beautiful, right? Because I think it's probably true for a lot of us, if not all of us, when we go to nature, you know, especially when I was in Joshua Tree, you see the rocks and you're like, oh, I think this, this one looks like a hand or well, that one looks like a head. Um, and I think that's really beautiful because um, us as human beings, we want to look for familiar things um, out of the unknown, right? Or kind of just using our imagination to add things to, to abstract things. So when I made a lot of these, I was also thinking these are kind of figure-like um, or body parts like rocks or formations, and there's al always like a story attached to it. Yes, and so it's almost like this this rock per, this this is the from the perspective of the rock that has been anthropomorphized. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And I think I, I was also find it kind of hard to convey that to people, you know, because I think it was really important to say in my head. But I, I like adding these um, poetic stories really kind of add like a narrative part to these virtual sculptures or landscape work. Yeah, it really, um, it sort of, yeah, forms this kind of speculative narrative. And I think it's really cool how people do this with New Art City that, you know, with a game engine, you're kind of accustomed to this mode of storytelling, but in it, with the constraints of New Art City means it's not so much like an interaction that it kind of really requires the audience to like, fill in and and um, investigate to, to pull all of the news. Yeah, I really love that. You know, it's like, how do you do storytelling, right? Almost through world building. Um, and I was going, I'm going down through this, this water area, but I, I can't tell if I'm going the right way or if I'm going to go into the void or hit a dead end. Yeah, I think you can make a turn make a U-turn or going back to um, where we came from and there's a, another path I see. that takes you to the other side. So we're going backwards and yeah. we see the person so we'll suspended the, by the, the hair right. But we go, yeah, we go to the right through this foggy valley and then we're back, back on the water again. 
and we see another another shape coming out of the fog, immensely tall. Um, and there's, it's sort of like a tree structure, like there's a central trunk and then we have a, a hand coming up to the left and we have a, like a thigh and a leg coming up to the right and we have another hand coming out of it. And there's this, it's sort of this celestial purple blue, um, like dotted kind of texture. And then the rope that is all suspended around it in anti-gravity is on each, on one end is a hand, on the other end is a foot. Um, and it's it's going on this gradient from the, the blue hand to the, the blue green foot and it's wrapped all around the sculpture. And I'll read the description now. One handed bowline, <clears throat> eyes closed. I tried to sleep but my thoughts kept growing like floating ropes. They tangled up and it become unavoidable, bouncing and heavy. I had to open my eyes and saw I was back to where I started. I tried to speak, but no words come out. Hmm, so this is kind of a return to the beginning, the, the like, you know, are you lost, you must be lost. <laughs> Exactly. And it, I mean, I guess it kind of mirrors the structure that you were talking about as you were like formulating the rules of the world through the drawings that you like once you get past the third one, you kind of start to establish what the rules of the game are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I and I think, um, you know, I think I, I like this. Um, different pieces of descriptions kind of indicates a little bit of new information to the audience and kind of depends on also the route you take, right? You might form different kind of ideas of who you are or who this, this person writing um, is and um, what the world is you're in. Right, because you, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, if I keep going back this way, it'll take us right. So that is, that is the, this is the land bridge that we started on. So I went right at the land bridge, but if I had gone left, we would be seeing this narrative in reverse. So either way, when you start, we're, we're kind of losing language and describing that loss of language with language. <laughs> Yeah, and because I designed the the path um, like a loop, so if you start either from left or right, I think in general I I, I do kind of try to make people start with the right one. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the one you kind of see a little bit earlier, and because it's rotating, I think in general that would attract people's attention to go towards that way. Um, but when you come out from the loop, right, you realize you're you're back to where you were. Mm -hmm. And so here we are at the start again. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, thank you so much for making this and for sharing it with me. Um, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you want to speak to? Any hidden Easter eggs? <laughs> I think I'm I'm thinking about whether I should reveal a little bit of the maybe the story more. Um, I think that's good. You know, it's kind of like a reward for people who who are watching the video who made it to the end, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so for the first uh, sculpture, this one, the the blue one, we saw. Um, it's a conversation, right? So there is a voice asking, are you a lost soul? I try to speak, but no words come out. So um, as a protagonist navigating, or as the player or the audience navigating through this world, um, you are a lost soul and you ended up on this um, island or this um, you know, destination. And then you're trying to figure out, you know, what this is or who you are. 
and this voice who's leading you through it um, is actually kind of like a guarding spirit mm. that kind of leads you or giving you hints through the world. Um, and I think once you're the, the lost soul, well, they're going through the world, um, not only they're trying to, they are piecing things together about what this world is, but they are also kind of piecing together who they are um, by, you know, kind of, I think from the second sculpture scene, right? The falling or hanging one, right? Because they looked down, they saw this little person in their hand, but then the voice was indicating, you know, this little person is actually a little piece of yourself. So because you're a lost soul, you know, you're, you're also kind of lost in the world, but you're also kind of lost who you are. Um, yeah. It feels like a really good metaphor for life, right? That we're kind of trying to figure out what we're doing here and who we are. But yeah, I mean, I think ha like, it's such a poetic use of these like game mechanics and it's such a like dreamlike state. Uh, it all goes so fluidly together. Well, I, uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I look forward to this being published and everybody seeing it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's great to chat with you and talk about things. Um, <laughs> yeah. Stop recording.